Well, good morning, CLF Church, and welcome to Sunday morning online service. Uh, if you're joining us and you got the word that we're just online, thank you so much for your flexibility. Um, and you know what? What's so cool is that we live in a day, we live in an age where if we can't be together in person, that we still have the avenues, we have the technology to be able to connect around God's word, uh, to connect in prayer, to connect in spirit, uh, and come together as a, as a people, as a church body online, and um, praying that we'll be back together next week in person. Um, but you know, I, uh, I am just so excited for this new series that we're starting, Creative. And uh, so I'm gonna have the first message for that series uh, today. Before I do that though, uh, there's just a couple things I want to make you aware of. First of all, February 13th is our business meeting. Uh, it's a very, uh, very important meeting. If you're a member, please do anything and everything you can to be present, to be voting. Um, we're gonna be voting on a new lead pastor. I hear he's a good guy. Um, but anyway, if, uh, if you wanna be there for that. And then also, if you haven't done so yet, we are still taking deacon nominations. Today's the last day for that. Uh, you can send those to Pastor Jeff to his email. Um, and uh, basically, a deacon is a servant to the church, uh, a servant to the vision of the house and, and to the work in the, of the kingdom and what God's doing at CLF. Uh, it's not necessarily a glamorous job um, by any means, but it's very important. And we need to prayerfully consider about uh, who takes those positions as servants um, and, and leadership in the church. So if you haven't done so, you can send those nominations in. Uh, so, you know, with that, I want to start my message, but I really felt this morning, like, I just want to pray, um, just entering into this service right now, this home service or wherever you might be viewing from. Um, I know that God is omnipresent. I know that the Lord is so present to any of those who just call out, seek him, invite him in. And so we just do that with me. Let's just invite the Lord to unite us in spirit right now, unite us as we come around his word. Because, you know, when his word is released, how, whatever avenue, whatever way his word is released, it does not return void. It produces exactly what God sent it to produce. And I believe that the word of the Lord that he has today is going to be um, a really important word for you as an individual as well as for CLF as we move forward into 2022. 2022 is a year of victory. It's a year of, of taking back some of what the enemy has stolen. And I just, I believe we need to embrace that. We need to embrace what God says about this year moving forward. God is always positive. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is, is the happiest person that you've ever met. And so we just need to invite him to come in and just lift your spirits. If you're dealing with COVID like I am, if you're dealing with some other sickness, if you're dealing uh, with fatigue and in, in, in emotional areas or financial areas or whatever it may be, um, everything changes when the presence of the Lord comes in. So will you pray with me? Father, we just thank you today that as we seek your face, God, we may be physically distanced all over uh, the region right now. We may be in homes and we may be separated from our church family physically, but God, we are not socially distanced. <laughs> God, we are very connected socially. We thank you for that. And more importantly, we are spiritually connected. I thank you that there is so much unity in our church, God. I thank you even for the way that there is, there is a compassion and a love that is evident in CLF, uh, the way we look out for each other and pray for one another. And so Lord, today, um, unite us. Today, God, as your word um, is spoken, God, I am just a very weak vessel <laughs> this morning, but God, I believe in your power. And God, I believe that you want to transform our mindsets. You want to transform our hearts this morning, and you want to empower us, Lord God, to walk in the fullness of everything that you've called us to walk in today. And so I pray, God, that your presence, your presence right now, God, would just be manifest in every location that we are watching and engaging and participating in today. And we invite you, we invite you, Lord, to have your way in our hearts, to have your way in our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Amen. And I want to also encourage you, um, if you're watching on the goclf.online.church <laughs> uh, platform, which is the link from our website and the one we sent out in the email, uh, on the sidebar there, there is just a place to interact. There's a place to give amens. There's a place to comment. There's a place to, um, to participate. And so I encourage you to do that as we go through the message today. So we are starting the series called Creative. And today the, the title of the message is Image of the Creator. And, um, you know, as Christians, the, one of the core beliefs, really the core belief um, that we have is, is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we also, we believe in creation. So if you went through school, you know, and, and you were taught evolution in science class, you were taught, you know, different theories, um, you were taught maybe different religions, if you ever took a religions class, um, we believe that there is a creator. We believe that God is the creator who made everything. He was before and he will always be. Anything was created. He spoke and the heavens and the earth were made. And, and we believe in an all powerful God. And once you get past that, then you look at the fact that our God is three parts, the Trinity, um, the three part Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and every single one of them were present and represented at the very beginning when the creation took place in Genesis 1. We see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We see the unity there. We see them all in the creation. We see Jesus didn't show up just 2,000 years ago, but he's actually present throughout the whole Old Testament. And, and so God is this majestic, amazing, just huge, huge, huge God. And I say all that because as we get into today, I just want to take a minute and step back and, and I want you to just admire the greatness of God. I want you to think about the greatness of this God who with one word caused all the galaxies to come into existence. Um, everything that we see is that it's the creative genius of a God who is so much greater and more incredible than we could ever put into words. And so with who God is, I want you just to think for a minute, how does that change your perspective on the situations that you're dealing with in your life right now? How does that change the way that you navigate this life that God's put you in when you know that the God of all creation, the one who knows all things, is in all things, the one who is all powerful, the one who never makes mistakes, that God is not only alongside you, but he is in you. And you are one with him. How does that change the way that you look at your earthly experience right now? Um, you know, we are not here on earth to survive. We're not, God didn't put us here and he wasn't like, okay, I'm gonna set you in, in the year 2020 and 2021, stinks to be you, you know? He's not like, I hope you make it. I hope you survive. He didn't put us on earth to survive. He put us on earth with a mission. If you're a believer, and I believe even if you're not a believer, you're just a pre-Christian because God's got your number. If you're watching this today, and I believe that God has a mission for you. He's got a purpose for you. You know, when I was a kid, I had like three movies that I drove my family crazy with because I would just watch them over and over and over, you know, days of VHS. So I'd get through the movie and then, you know, I'd hit stop and rewind and wait 10 minutes and start it right back at the beginning. And it's just like, I just watch these movies over and over. The first one was Rad. You may not know that one. It was a BMX movie and I raced BMX and I loved <laughs> that movie. Um, the other one was Smokey and the Bandit and that's probably self-explanatory TV version. Um, and then the, the last one was the Blues Brothers, you know, also TV version. And uh, one of the lines, and if you know the movie, you know, um, the Blues Brothers were trying to get the band back together and they encounter all these different characters and they're always brought with some kind of opposition. Like, what you're doing is impossible. How in the world do you think you're ever going to do that? And you all know the line. What was the line that they always said? No, you don't understand. We're on a mission from God. You know, and so, I mean, that's probably a little blasphemous the way that they said it and out of context, but in our context, that should be our daily declaration 
for every impossibility and every obstacle and everything that we face and come up against is no, you don't understand devil. You know, you don't understand those who, who are, are speaking all the negativity in our life. We're on a mission from God. We are here on mission. We are in here. We are here on earth with a purpose. And so, you know, it, all through church history, there has been these ups and downs and these ebbs and flows um, of, of really prosperous times in the church, really easy, almost kind of too comfortable times in the church. And then the lowest of lows where the persecution was so heavy, you know, that many, <laughs> many believers were like, you know what, I almost want to be a martyr because it'd be easier than dealing with life. Um, we're not there, you know, we don't have it that bad in America in 2022. We really don't. But throughout history, um, everybody had to make two different statements. They either had to make the statement to God and say, God, why did you put me here in this super dark time? And just lamenting and crying out and complaining or having the statement saying, okay, God, what have you ordained for me for such a time as this? Why did you choose to put me here for such a time as this? And I say that because I want you to know if you're alive and you have breath in your lungs and you're on the earth right now today, that means God believes in you. <laughs> that means that God chose to put you here because he believes that you cannot just make it through life during this time frame that we've been blessed to be put on the earth, but he believes that you can be victorious, that you can actually make a difference and that you can fulfill the high call of God he has for your life right here, right now, today. He says, don't give up. Don't give in because I have got the provision for you. It's like Esther, you know, in, in the Bible, Esther. Um, I know we have an Esther that may be watching right now, but, you know, you too, Esther. But, you know, Esther in the Bible, um, she was put in a very, very difficult situation. But the word of the Lord that came to her was, you're here. What if you're here for such a time as this? You know, what if you're here because... There is things, there are souls, there's, there's history to be made through your life in such a time as this. And so um, God is creator. Getting back to my message here. God is the one who created us in his image. And um, I want to feed into your soul today the value that God places on your life. Okay, that's, that's the starting foundational point of this series. You got to know what God thinks about you. You got to know how much God values your life. Um, when God created every living thing, he spoke to the creation to bring forth life out of his creation, right? Um, except humanity. He spoke to the earth and he called out vegetation. He spoke to the earth. He called animals. He spoke animals into existence. He separated the waters with a word he, he brought order to all the chaos, but he did something different when he created you and I. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, it says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. So everybody just stop right there. And I just want you to say to yourself out loud, I want you to say, I am blessed by God. <laughs> I am blessed by God. He blessed them and he said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it and reign over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. I don't know if you caught it, but at the beginning of this scripture, God says, let us, speaking to himself, us, plural, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, let us make human beings in our image. We are created in the image of God. There's no other part of creation that is created in God's image. 
that that very fact that sets us apart from all the animals, it sets us apart from every angelic being even, because we are the only part of God's creation where he spoke to himself and said, let's create them in our image. And what that means is that we are a product of God wanting to have representation of himself in his own creation. He wanted to have someone, he wanted to have a race of people that represented him in the earth. And I'm not just talking about, you know, as, as, as New Testament believers, we believe that we are Christ's body on the earth. We do represent Jesus on the earth. And that's where we're at today. But even from the very beginning of time, when God created Adam, he said in his image, he wanted Adam to represent himself in the garden, to represent what he looks like, his glory, for, for, for all of the rest of the creation, to see Adam, to see Eve, to see their offspring, and, and to, to see them and to have them reflect God, to be a constant reminder of the creator because they are creation, but they're created in the image of the creator. So mankind has the God-given design. Okay, if you, if you heard out in the scripture, it says to what? To bear fruit. We are designed to bear fruit, All right? So that means we're to produce something, right? We, we have the ability, we have everything within us created by the creator in the image of God, we have the ability to bear fruit, to produce with our life, to multiply. And, um, you know, you might be saying, well, that means you're supposed to have a lot of children. And, and there is a truth that you're supposed to, you know, I mean, if, if we don't multiply, then the human race dies, right? But, but there's also this very powerful truth that as believers, we are to multiply sons and daughters. We are to raise up the disciples. That's the great commission. That's the mission that we've been given. We are to fill, fill the earth. We are to govern and we are to reign. That's our design. That's the way God designed you. That's what's inside of your life as a human and as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ who's been bought back from the curse and been redeemed. These are the qualities. These are the, the things that are written in your code, <laughs> written in your DNA, your spiritual DNA. I mean, think about this. So, so God created an eagle to fly, and it's amazing to watch an eagle fly. God created a snake to slither on the ground. I'm not a big fan of snakes. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm really glad they're on the ground, and um, they're under my feet, you know? <laughs> and hopefully they don't attack my toes if I'm wearing flip-flops. But, but if you were to take a snake and you were to glue feathers to it, and you were to put it into a nest up in a tree, and then throw that snake out of the tree, I can guarantee you one thing, it will never fly. Because it's not in its design to fly. It was never created or designed to fly. So it's important to know how we're designed. It's important to know how God designed you, you know, and that what is in our design, what's in the blueprint of our life. Um, you and I were created by a creator to create and to reign and to govern. Um, God spoke everything into existence, but he made man differently. Let's look a little deeper here. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. So you can just picture, just picture that. Picture his hands, just the forming of the dust, the dirt coming together, you know. It's like the father's like, okay, Jesus, you, you do the face, you know, and Okay, Holy Spirit, you you go ahead, you do the feet, since you're the one that's gonna make the, the feet move and, and go places and do things. You're gonna be leading those feet, you know? But, but it says that God formed man from the dust of the ground, and then he did this amazing thing. He breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils. <coughs> Excuse me. And the man became a living person. And so, this is the creation story of mankind, but we also know in the Bible, it says that we are fearfully, you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. That, that we know the thoughts that God has towards us, that, that even when we were being formed in the womb, God knew us, he was forming us, he was, he was weaving us together, just like, <coughs> excuse me, the dust that God formed in the ground, he now uses the womb of the woman 
to form the body and the life, but just the same way that he breathed into Adam, the breath of life, we get that same breath. We are breathed. We are life breathed by God. We are created in his image and it's the life of God. It's his breath in our lungs, right? You know that song. That's the air that we breathe. It's your breath in our lungs. And so God, um, God creates us in his image with his life to be creative. He calls us to be creative. Now we're not just, you know, um, we're not just dirt, you know, I mean, I wouldn't call my, my body dirt, but we are created um, and put in a body that is going to decay and go back into the ground. But what is eternal is our soul and is our spirit. And, and we know that the world lives just according to the flesh and, and what is physical and what can be seen. But as believers, we live outside of that, that small paradigm. We live in a, in a much broader perspective where we see things from a spiritual um, perspective. And so in James 1, verse 17 through 18, it says, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. <coughs> and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. This is the NLT version. Other translations say we became the first fruits. But I love, ever since I read this for the first time in the NLT, it just, it grabbed hold of me. Just thinking about the fact that of all, out of all of God's creation, he says that you and I are his prized possession. We're his workmanship. We're his masterpiece. We are the ones that he has crowned with his own glory. We've been created in his image. Hopefully you can feel the value of your life rising. Just thinking about that. God, who made everything, all the beauty that we could know and we can see, he looks at you and he says, you're my prized possession. And so what does that do to a real enemy who was created the most beautiful of all the angelic beings named Lucifer, who was created for the sole purpose of bringing glory and worshiping God and worshiping God's splendor, who became prideful and was cast out of heaven. And one day he's in the garden and this man shows up and this woman shows up, Adam and Eve, and in his eyes, they look like God. In his eyes, they, they reflect the glory of God that he was once supposed to worship, but his pride caused him to fall. And now he looks at Adam and Eve and he says, I will do anything to destroy you because you are a constant reminder of my failure, constant reminder of everything that I've lost. And so that's the same for you and I. When Satan sees us, if you know the story, Lucifer now called Satan as the fallen angel. Satan, he looks at our lives and he's bitter and he's jealous and he hates us and despises us because he feels like if he can kill and steal and destroy from us, if he can destroy our life, then it's like he can get towards God. He can destroy something that isn't made in God's image to reflect God and is connected to God and is God's what God calls his most prized possession. Satan is waging a full-out attack on humanity to devalue and limit how we walk in our God-given design. The detour of our walking and our purpose came when sin entered the earth. When Adam and Eve sinned, all of a sudden, their responsibilities changed, their securities changed, their purpose, their relationship with God changed. Everything changed and and they gave their authority over to Satan and Satan then had power to control them, to bring fear, to bring a murderous heart, to pervert the things that God has called beautiful. See, but Jesus came to break the power of sin. He, he redeems us from the curse and he reestablishes our God-given ability to represent him in the earth, right? So everything that was lost in sin in Adam was restored back with Christ. Jesus came so that we could again find real purpose, 
so that we again wouldn't just be surviving in this earth, but we would be ruling and reigning with Christ, that we would have a creative ability to allow God to work through our lives to produce, to fill the earth with his glory, to fill the earth with, with things that represent him and that are beautiful, to, to, to be fruitful and produce something great with our lives. John 10.10 10 says, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So we know what the enemy did. We know what his purpose is, but you got to hear God's purpose. Jesus came so that you could have life, so that he could bring life in place of the death that we were born into in sin, that he can give us abundance. And, and ultimately, you know what? When, when God sets us free from sin, he's not just setting us free from sinful activity. See, sin, sin is not just action. Action is actually the manifestation of sin because we know sin starts in the heart. It starts in the mind. It starts, it starts with wrong thinking. When our thinking is wrong, when, when we think along the lines of the world and the patterns and the strategies of the enemy, and, and when our heart is actually acting out of fear and insecurity and trying to find wholeness in places other than God, it actually manifests, it goes through our life and it comes out as sin. And we oftentimes try to change the action without changing the heart, but it starts first with understanding who we are in Christ. It, it starts first with understanding that God has more for us than just to be free from sinful action. He actually wants us to move out of what we don't do and, and just sinning and actually move into victorious living, actually move into a purpose, a high call, doing things that actually put a, a nail in the coffin on Satan's strategies and plans and purposes. He actually wants us to be people that come against hell and, and push hell back, advance God's kingdom and push the, the, the powers of hell and the strategies and the purposes of hell back. It's really important to get our head around that in this day we live in because the enemy is doing all he can right now to make us feel defeated, to make us feel like we don't have hope, to make us feel like, like hell has invaded the earth and the church doesn't have power to do anything about it. But that's not the truth. If the church is still here, then we still have a purpose. If the church is still here, then there's still souls to be brought into the kingdom. There's still things to accomplish. God is not done with you if you're a part of the church because we're here. And he, he absolutely loves to put his glory on display through those who are created in his image. That's why we're here. Amen. So this whole series was actually sparked um, out of a... Uh, an article that I happened to run into that just kind of like, um, it just kind of blew up, you know, in my mind. I was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is profound. It's, it's amazing. And it's actually a study that was done by NASA. And um, NASA was looking uh, for a way to try to figure out um, some of the best problem solvers that they could hire on, uh, that there were the most creative people to help um, figure out how to do things differently and be more efficient and fix things that were really difficult. And so let me just read this article, this portion of this article to you of what they did. NASA had contacted Dr. George Land and Beth Jarman to develop a highly specialized test that would give them the means to effectively measure the creative potential of NASA's rocket scientists and engineers. The test turned out to be so very successful for NASA's purposes, but the scientists were left with a few questions. Where does creativity come from? Are some people born with it or is it learned? Or does it come from our experience? So the question then is, you know, how do you develop creativity? How do you grow creativity in people? And so this is what they did. The scientists then gave the test to 1,600 children between the ages of four and five. What they found shocked them. This is the test that looks at the ability to come up with new, 
different and innovative ideas to problems. What percentage of those children do you think fell in the genius category of imagination? So out of 1,600 children between the ages of four and five, how many do you think fell in the genius category of creativity? And the answer is a full 98%. Almost 100% of these four and five-year-olds were considered creative geniuses when they took this test developed by NASA. So, but this is not the real story. The scientists were so astonished that they decided to make it a longitudinal test and they tested the children again five years later when they were 10 years old. The result is only 30% of the children now fell in the genius category of imagination. Then the kids were tested at 15 years and the figure had dropped to 12%. And about, um, what about adults? How many of us are still in contact with our creative genius after the years of schooling that we've been through? It says, sadly, only two percent of adults fall into the creative genius category according to this test. And for those who question the consistency of these results or think they may be isolated incidents, these results have actually been replicated more than a million times. So this is what hit me as soon as I read that article, is that when we are born and we are created by a creator in the image of the creator, we have creativity just coming out of every place of our life and our mind and our body. Like we are just creative geniuses. <laughs> we, are, we are born into this life and we don't think of what's possible and not possible. We don't think in the terms of, oh, that can be done or that can't be done. We just have this clean palette, this clean slate. And, and you know, as believers, don't we always say, you know, with God, nothing's impossible. All things are possible to those who believe. We can have faith for anything. But you know what? We say that, but I, I think sometimes we just say that, we regurgitate that, and it's almost a religious thing. Like, well, I believe God can do anything, but what if God actually wants to do something through you? What if the, the whole purpose of us being on the earth is that the creative genius of God can flow through your life because that's why we're here? I mean, I don't know about you, but as I grew up, I, I probably had a really great imagination when I was four or five years old. But as I grew, people began to tell me, no, that's not how you do things. That's not how that's done. That's not possible. That doesn't make sense. That's a stupid idea. Why would you ever think that? You know, you start getting rejection. You start having people tell you that, that the way you do things or how you like things isn't right. And so what happens is we've conformed. We've conformed to what the standard of the world is. Right. And we've had to learn even going through school and everything. We've had to we've had to learn the way that they tell us to learn. We've had to take the test that they tell us we have to take. But God has wired all of us so very differently and, and we're all unique and we all are a reflection of God. But but God's characteristics are endless. And so that's why the power of the body of Christ is so important because we all have different giftings and we have different talents and we all have different things to offer to the body of Christ to reflect the fullness of who Christ is, right? And so it's really important um, that, we, that we understand that when we come into Christ, he actually wants to bring us back to the original design of humanity where we have creativity, where, where we can think outside of what is naturally possible because that's what miracles are. That's what faith is. When you talk to someone and say, you know what, God is not logically possible. And you say, well, I just have faith that he is. But you know what, as you have faith in God, then you begin to see God answer with manifestation. You begin to see God answer and, and show you that as you release your faith, as you believe, he shows up with evidence. He gives us evidence based on our belief and what we can believe for. Um, the study talks about how um, these kids were monitored while they were taking these tests and, and they were monitoring the brain processing that was going on as we age. Um, and so in every group, they, they found out that the older the group was, the more the critical area of their brain um, was illuminated in the testing results, more so than the imaginative side of their brain. 
And so that, that just kind of hit me too, because just think, you know, when you think of a critical person, what do you think of? You know, you think of somebody that's just always very negative, somebody that, that is sitting back just judging everyone else and judging how everybody else is at things. But what happens is when you're judgmental and you're critical of other people, you actually just kind of assume that everybody's judgmental and critical of you, right? And so it actually makes you afraid to be bold about what God has put on your heart and what God's called you to do or how he's called you to live you know, or, or how he's called your life to be separate and to be set apart and different from the rest of the world. Because a critical spirit, I believe, is, is tied to the patterns of the world that the enemy ha has tried to dumb us down to. That we just sit back and we say, we're only going to live according to what's logical. We're only, only going to live according to the facts that we hear spoken to us and told us. I think it's really important in this day we live in. There are so many voices that are speaking so many things to us, but if they're not God's voice, we need to be very careful of how we let that affect our heart, how we let that affect our faith. Um, I think we stop believing and dreaming because of what others think. Um, the pattern of the world points to a fear of man. At the root of the pattern of the world, we care more about what people think than what we care about what God thinks about our life. Um, Matthew 18, verse 1 and 5 through 5, it says, About that time the disciples came to Jesus, and they asked him this, this loaded question, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who is going to be the greatest? Who, who is it? We want to know. <laughs> we want to aspire to be that, you know? And Jesus called a little child to him and he put the child among them. And then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What a shock to their system, right? He brings this little child, maybe four or five years old, and he says, you need to be more like this little child. And what he's talking about is the innocence of this kid's heart. He's talking about the fact that Jesus can tell this child anything and he will just absolutely believe it. Now, I'm not saying that, and Jesus isn't saying that we're supposed to be naive. We're supposed to be wise in this world. But when it comes to what God says, we need to take that as absolute. When we read the word of God and we see what God can do and what is possible and what he wants us to believe for, and when we get a word spoken to our heart that seems absolutely impossible, maybe a directional word for our life, directional word in our church, and we, we, we could have a critical spirit rise up or we can just stop and say, okay, God, if you're in this, I believe because I trust you. I have a heart that believes that you are able to do anything and everything that you set out to do. And I don't want to get in the way of that. I actually want to move with you, God. I actually want to be locked in with you. And I want to be a part of the victory that you want to bring in the earth. See, a pure heart and an innocent heart is able to believe and have faith like a child. Um, today is not the time to open our ears to all the voices screaming at us that there is no hope. And you don't have to look far to get that. <laughs> it is time to tune our ear to heaven for the creativity and the hope of our creator. This is our time and this is our hour to be the church that Jesus said, the gates of hell will not penetrate, will not come against. The church is more powerful today than we realize. There, there is like this, this sleeping giant, I believe, in the American church. And God's calling it to wake up. God's calling us to wake up and to be the church outside of the four walls in the context of religion or the context of service uh, on once a week or a couple times a week in a church building. He's calling us to live as the church of Jesus Christ and to put on display the creativity, the image of God, the glory of God in the earth. There's people in the world right now that are desperately seeking hope they're desperately seeking something that is bigger and better than what they're seeing in front of them right now. And the church is the answer. We are the key. 
to that. The world needs the church to walk in childlike faith and hope in our daddy God who put us here for such a time as this. Amen. You can type amen. You can say it. <laughs> Romans 12, 1 through 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, it all starts in how we think. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. God wants us to fully engage our lives with him. That's the word for 2022 right there, isn't it? We need to engage with God. We need to be all about what God is doing on the earth. We need to, we need to turn our, our view and our, our full heart attention away from what's going on in the world and all the chaos. And we need to look at the creator who brings order to chaos, who brings light to darkness. Amen. You know, we're, we're in the middle of a fast right now. And however you are engaging in that fast, um, if you haven't started yet, it's not too late. We still have two weeks. Um, maybe it's food, maybe it's media, maybe it's, you know, anything that gets in your way. Um, but I just want to encourage you. There, there's something connected to the creativity of God um, in our lives and, and, and disconnecting from the things of this world, the patterns of this world, the things that's feeding our flesh, feeding the worldliness in us, getting that out of the way and just digging into the word of God digging into the life source, which is the word of God. You know, um, Jesus is the word. It's his breath. Every word in the Bible is God breathed. Now put that, connect that and put that in context of the fact that we are God breathed. We are created in God's image. We were formed by God, by his very own hands. And then he breathed life into us. The word of God is his breath. The word of God is breathed out of the heart of God. And as we, as we ingest the word, as we eat and feed on the Bible, on the word of God, it's what renews us. It's what brings life to the dead areas. It's what changes our situations. And it's not just reading it and storing it away, but it's reading it and, and speaking it. It's reading it and letting it direct us. It's reading it and then walking it out and living it out and applying it to our lives. See, where we go... Getting back to my message. Uh, where we go, we represent Jesus in the earth, and we're here to carry his glory. I want to I wanna read the same scripture, one verse, in two different translations. First, the Amplified, and then I'm going to read it in the message, because I love the way uh, the message kind of fleshes it out. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, We are destroying sophisticated arguments in every exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. So just think about that. When, when whatever sophisticated argument, whatever propaganda, whatever exaltation of worldly things is being spoken, whatever news is coming at us, we are actually uh, in a position to cast down those things if they come if they come against if if they are setting themselves up against what God says. And so we first have to know what God says, but then we have to be able to discern the voices that are coming at us and where they're coming from and to be able to cast them down, to reject them, to resist them. It says if we resist the enemy, he must flee. This is what it says in the message. I love this. It says the world is unprincipled. It's a dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing the entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. When God says to be fruitful 
It means to produce something out of nothing. Let the life of God produce life through you. Let the life of God produce life through you. Watch all these voices come in, and when you have the life of God in you, you have the authority, you have the power to govern, to reign over, to come against and to cast down everything that is contrary to what God says. You don't have to let it into your heart. You don't have to let it uh, uh, callous your heart to where you don't have faith for God anymore, where you don't believe for things that you don't believe. Maybe that God has something for you to do. Maybe you're young and you, and, and you feel like, you know what, you have things set out in front of you. It's, it's impossible. It's impossible to accomplish anything in this world because of the state of the world. Or maybe you feel like you're too old and you know what, if you were going to do anything, you've already done it and things are just really dismal right now and you're just like ready to go home to be with the Lord. Let me just tell you that that hopelessness, that is the narrative of the world coming at you, but God has a better word. God's word says nothing's impossible and it's never too late. And if you're here, you're not surviving, you're on mission, you're commissioned with Christ. You have a purpose and you have a calling. Let me just tell you that Antioch cannot stay the same in 2022. Round Lake, Bristol, Lindenhurst, wherever you're at, Lake Villa, we are called to this region as the Church of Jesus Christ to make a difference, to put God's glory on display. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it and reign over creation. And I'm going to close here, but I just want to read <clears throat> one last section of scripture for you. And I want to encourage you to read through this this week. I want you to, to write this down. It's going to come up on the screen. I want you to write down the scripture. Just read 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Just read the whole chapter. But I'm going to read chapter 4 verses 3 through 10 and then 16 through 18. Because I believe that it's like, it's like Paul is just touching on so many things that are in this message on my heart today. And I, and I can't say it better than him. So I'm, I'm going to read this to you and then I'm going to pray for you. It says, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it's hidden only from the people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We knock down, but are knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in death, the death of Jesus Christ, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Verse 16, that is why we never give up. Let me say it again. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are renewed, transformed every day. For our present troubles are small and they won't last very long. That's good news. We can take that to the bank. What you're going through right now, your, your present troubles are small and they won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Amen. Let me pray for you. Lord, I just thank you today, God, that we are created in your image, that we are created with purpose. Lord, that 
whatever we walk through, whatever trials, whatever troubles, whatever physical attacks, whatever spiritual attacks we come up against, what the enemy planned for evil, God, you turn around for good. You make us stronger. You actually show your glory through our life when we persevere, when we overcome. Lord, when we choose to believe in the midst of hopelessness, when we choose to be creative and, and ask you to give us ideas from heaven to deal with things that no one's ever had to deal with before. God, we know that you have every strategy that can ever be thought up. You have it stored up in heaven and you want to release it upon your people. God, you want the strategies of heaven to flow through the church. God, that we can be the answer to the questions that the world is asking. God, that we can reach out and we can call people who are lost and hurting and broken and hopeless. God, into a freedom, into a restoration, into a redemption that is only available through you, Jesus. God, I pray for every person right now as, as they're in this fast, as they're seeking you, God, as they're praying prayers, God, I pray for the, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit to be active in our lives, the dynamite power of God that breaks yokes, that breaks bondages, God, that helps us to see with clear eyes, that helps us to see from your perspective, that helps us to pray God, according to your will and according to your purposes. Oh God, I just pray a blessing on every household today and every person that is, is hearing this word. I pray, Lord God, that you would show up in miraculous, powerful ways. Lord, that you would make your word come alive and bring healing and hope and life to every dead place of our lives this week as we seek you. This week, God, as we pursue you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a blessed su Sunday. Stay warm. Love you all.